welcome to a new video in our unit on complex analysis. In this video, we'll be exploring the complex derivative. This video is adapted from Visual Complex Analysis by Tristan Needham. First, we'll define what it means for a complex function to be a conformal map and use that to define the complex derivative. We'll show that if a complex function is a conformal mapping, then that function has a well-defined complex derivative almost everywhere. The consequence of this is a system of linear differential equations called the Cauchy-Riemann equations that we can use to construct complex analytic functions with specific properties. In the first video in this series, we looked at complex functions as maps from the complex plane to the complex plane. Here is an example of the map z goes to z squared. We can show that under this map, squares get mapped to squares. We can see this in both the Cartesian representation and in the polar one. One fact about this map that isn't completely obvious is that both the initial square and its image have 90 degree angles at all of their corners. Instead of squares, consider a pair of curves. If they form an angle theta at their intersection initially, they will form the same angle under the map z goes to z squared. This happens despite the fact that in this map the polar angle theta gets mapped to 2 theta. Let's show analytically that infinitesimal squares get mapped to infinitesimal squares. The map z goes to z squared can be written in Cartesian coordinates as u plus iv equals x plus iy squared, which equals x squared minus y squared plus 2ixy. Let's look at the families of curves u equals constant and v equals constant. These form a basis for the image complex plane. Consider the implicit derivatives of these curves, ux equals 2x minus 2yy prime equals 0, and vx equals 2y plus 2xy prime equals 0. Thus the slope for the curve of constant u is y prime equals x divided by y, and the slope for curves of constant v is y prime equals minus y divided by x. Thus the lines of constant u and v are always orthogonal to one another. Since u and v are a complete set of coordinates for c, every point except for z equals 0 and z equals infinity preserve angle under the mapping z goes to z squared. Maps like z goes to z squared that preserve angle at almost every point are called conformal. A more formal way to look at this is by looking at the Jacobian of the map. Consider an infinitesimal vector in the initial space dx dy transpose. Then the Jacobian is the linear transformation that maps dx dy to du dv. We can find the components of j by calculating the total derivatives du equals dx u dx plus dy u dy and dv equals dx v dx plus dy v dy. Thus the Jacobian matrix is given by j equals ux uy vx vy, which for this map is given by 2x minus 2y 2y 2x. Or in polar coordinates, this equals 2r times cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta, which you might recognize as a rotation matrix. Locally, the transformation z goes to z squared is a rescaling by 2r and a rotation by theta. Any pair of curves that meet at a point z0 with angle alpha will be rotated by the same angle theta. Thus, angles are preserved in this map. Likewise, we can show that any map z goes to z to the n is conformal everywhere except z equals 0 and z equals infinity. This map is defined as w equals z to the n, which in polar coordinates is equal to r to the n e to the i n theta, or r to the n times cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. Therefore, the coordinate transforms are u equals x squared plus y squared to the n over 2 times cosine n times the arctan of y over x, and v equals x squared plus y squared to the n over 2 times sine n times the arctan of y over x. I'll leave it as an exercise to show that the Jacobian is j equals n r to the n minus 1 times cosine n minus 1 theta minus sine n minus 1 theta sine n minus 1 theta cosine n minus 1 theta. This is also a rescaling by n times r to the n minus 1 and a rotation by n minus 1 times theta. Thus, any function that can be described by a power series is locally conformal. When we first learned about derivatives, we were taught to think of the derivative as the slope of a graph of some function at the point x equals x naught. 
In vector calculus, we extended this idea to think of the derivative of a curve gamma as the unit tangent vector times a scale factor given by the magnitude of gamma prime of t. If we consider a 1D function to be a map from r to r, we can use the same notion to define our derivative. We start with a vector in the x direction, and the scale factor is given by f prime at x equals x naught. For complex functions, this scale factor is no longer a real value. It is a complex value. Here is some complex map. Let's look at what happens to a frame at the point z equals z naught under this mapping. It gets scaled and rotated. That is, it gets multiplied by a complex number. At the point z equals z naught, we can define the complex derivative f prime of z equals z naught to be the conformal factor or the combination of local rotation and rescaling of the point z naught under the map z goes to f of z. We call functions that can be complex differentiated holomorphic. An analytic function is a function that is locally given by a convergent power series. A function f is complex analytic if the power series for f at z equals z naught, which equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c n times z minus z naught to the n, converges to f of z in a neighborhood of z naught. Most maps from the complex plane to the complex plane are not conformal and therefore cannot be differentiated. These maps are not analytic functions. For example, the map z goes to the complex conjugate of z is not a conformal map. It has a scale factor, but it does not have a well-defined rotation. Therefore, f of z equals z bar is not an analytic function. Maps like this, which take theta to minus theta, are called anti-conformal. Not every analytic function is conformal at every point. Consider the map z goes to z squared. We've previously shown that this map is a double cover of c. The real axis gets mapped to the positive real axis and the imaginary axis gets mapped to the negative real axis. So something strange must happen at the origin. I'm gonna play this animation again so you can focus on what's happening at the origin. At the origin, the mapping isn't conformal. Theta goes to two theta. At this point, the conformal factor for the map is f prime of z equals zero equals zero. Equivalently, for the map z goes to z to the n, the angle at the origin is multiplied by n. The conformal factor is n times z to the n minus 1. Thus at z equals 0, f prime has a 0 of order n minus 1. Such points that are not conformal are called critical points. The conformal factor f prime of z for a map z goes to f of z acts locally as a linear transformation. Recall that a general linear transformation m equals a, b, c, d stretches a region by a factor lambda 1 along the direction e1 and lambda 2 along the direction e2, where the lambdas are the eigenvalues of m and the e's are its eigenvectors. Consider a conformal factor a plus ib acting at a point z equals x plus iy. The image under the conformal map of z is a plus ib times x plus iy, which equals ax minus by plus i times ay plus bx. This is equivalent to the linear transformation a minus b b a acting on the vector x y transpose. But we already know what this matrix is. It's the Jacobian of the transformation z goes to u plus iv. j equals dx u dy u dx v dy v. Since j must be a conformal factor, we arrive at the following conditions. dx u equals dy v and dx v equals minus dy u. These are the famous Cauchy-Riemann equations. This system of differential equations, along with continuity and differentiability, is a necessary and sufficient condition for a complex function z goes to f of z equals u plus iv to be holomorphic. Let's now establish the relationship between the Cauchy-Riemann equations and the complex derivative. Consider an infinitesimal square of side length epsilon at a point z equals z naught. The edge in the y direction is obtained by multiplying the edge in the x direction by i, which is a rotation by pi over 2. Under the transformation z goes to f of z, the edge in the x direction gets mapped to the change in x times the rate of change of f with x, which equals epsilon dxf. Likewise, the edge in the y direction gets mapped to epsilon dyf. Since this map is conformal, the new edge in the y direction is still the edge in the x direction multiplied by i. Thus, i times dxf equals dyf. 
If we separate this into its real and imaginary parts using the expansion i dx u plus i dx v equals dy u plus i dy v, we have found the cauchy riemann equations again. dx u equals dy v and dy u equals minus dx v. We also define the complex derivative as the conformal factor f prime of the transformation at a point z equals z naught. We can obtain the transformed value of epsilon under the map z goes to f of z by multiplying it by the conformal factor f prime. Thus, epsilon f prime equals epsilon dxf and i epsilon f prime equals minus i dyf. This gives us a functional relationship between f prime and the partial derivatives of the real functions u and v. Using the same logic, we can derive Cauchy-Riemann equations for different coordinate systems. For polar coordinates mapped to Cartesian ones, a map z equals r e to the i theta goes to u plus i v is holomorphic if it satisfies d theta u equals minus r dr v and d theta v equals r dr u. For polar coordinates that get mapped to polar coordinates, a map z goes to f of z, which equals r e to the i phi, is holomorphic if it satisfies d theta r equals minus r r dr phi and r d theta phi equals r dr r. Let's use what we've learned so far to derive some properties of the complex derivative. Consider two functions, f and g, whose derivatives are the conformal factors f prime equals a e to the i alpha and g prime equals b e to the i beta, respectively. We'll look at a point z naught and a neighboring point z equals z naught plus zeta under these maps. Under the map f of z, z naught goes to the point a and z naught plus zeta goes to a plus zeta f prime, which equals a plus zeta a e to the i alpha. Likewise, under the map g of z, z naught goes to the point b and z naught plus zeta goes to b plus zeta g prime, which equals b plus zeta b e to the i beta. Under addition, complex numbers add like vectors. So under the map f plus g, the point z naught plus zeta gets mapped to a plus b plus zeta times f prime plus g prime. This coefficient of zeta is the conformal factor of the map f plus g. Thus, f plus g prime equals f prime plus g prime. What about multiplication? Multiplication by a complex number acts as a rescaling combined with a rotation centered at the origin. We'll take the map of G and multiply it by the map of F. The neighborhood of point B gets rotated by alpha and rescaled by A. So under the map FG, the point Z naught plus zeta gets mapped to A plus zeta F prime times B plus zeta G prime, which equals AB plus zeta times A F prime plus B G prime plus higher order terms. Recall that A is the point Z naught under the map F and B is the point Z naught under the map G. Thus, f g prime equals f prime g plus g prime f, and thus we have recovered the product rule. Under composition g of f of z, we can take the first map f, which is a rescaling by a and a rotation by alpha, and apply the map g to it, which is a rescaling by b and a rotation by beta. Thus the total rescaling is by a times b, and the total rotation is by alpha plus beta. Thus we obtain the chain rule, g of f of z prime equals g prime of f of z f prime of z. And lastly, the inverse function. If we aren't near a critical point, the function f acts as a rescaling by a and a rotation by alpha. f inverse undoes this. So it acts as a rescaling by one over a and a rotation by minus alpha. Thus the complex derivative of f inverse is one over f prime of z. We can use these rules to show that every analytic function can locally be represented by a power series, and that analytic functions are infinitely differentiable. This last point about analytic functions being infinitely differentiable is an incredibly important result in complex analysis. One of the places this result is used is in showing that holomorphic functions are rigid. In mathematics, we call an object rigid if it can be uniquely determined with less information than you would expect to need. The complex derivative is incredibly restrictive, and we'll use it to demonstrate a rigidity result of holomorphic functions. Holomorphic functions are determined by the set of all derivatives at a single point. 
For example, imagine I want to construct an analytic function that maps concentric circles to straight vertical lines. Additionally, let's order them so that circles with larger radii get mapped to lines that are to the right of those coming from circles with smaller radii. In the first video in this series, we showed that e to the z is the inverse of this mapping. I can construct any number of functions that do this. For example, z goes to x squared plus y squared plus i y over x. This obviously is an analytic, as the map isn't conformal. There are clearly lines that started out orthogonal that aren't at right angles under the mapping. However, there is only one analytic function that works for this mapping. To find it, we'll need to use the cauchy riemann equations. d theta u equals minus r dr v and d theta v equals r dr u. Concentric circles or lines where r is constant get mapped to vertical lines or lines where u is constant. This means that rotations to the initial space don't affect where you are horizontally under the mapping. So d theta u equals zero. From the first cauchy riemann equation, dr v must also be zero. That leaves us with the second equation, d theta v equals r dr u. Since the left-hand side depends only on theta and the right-hand side depends only on r, we can set these equal to some constant c. d theta v equals c and r dr u equals c. We can integrate both of these. v equals c theta plus some constant and u equals c log r plus another constant. Combining these together into a complex function, f of z equals u plus iv equals c log r plus i theta plus some constant, we'll call it d, which equals f of z equals c log z plus d. All holomorphic functions must satisfy the appropriate cauchy riemann equations. Thus, up to constants, the complex log is the unique conformal mapping that sends concentric circles to parallel vertical lines. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.